So what are we trying to do? We're trying to make quantum computers solve hard and useful problems. Hard means problems which are way too difficult for classical computers to ever solve, and useful means that someone is going to be willing to pay for it. Now, quantum computers have the potential to disrupt almost all major industries, and this has been the focus of the last couple of days. And therefore, today I will not talk to you anymore about the opportunities, but rather about the challenges and the road ahead. Before I do that, I'd just like to introduce QM and the team real quick. Our founding team includes people such as Jonathan Cohen and Nisim Ofek. Nisim was the first person worldwide to demonstrate quantum error correction by his own hands during his postdoc at Yale. And in our advisory board, we have great people such as Amir Yaakobi from Harvard and Scott Aronson, which you all know by now very well. QM have introduced the quantum orchestration platform. The quantum orchestration platform allows to realize the potential of any quantum processor. With our advanced classical hardware and electronics, we are introducing a whole new approach to controlling and operating quantum processors. Our quantum orchestration platform allows to run even the most complex quantum protocols of today and of tomorrow. From quantum machine learning to quantum error correction, you can run all of this with the quantum orchestration platform seamlessly by software with no need for any more hardware engineering on the classical side. Now, the big question is, of course, why don't we have full-scale quantum computers yet? And most of the answers to this question would eventually result to the qubit, right? The qubit is this fundamental, magical building block of the quantum computer. And normally, after we glorify the qubit, we start saying very terrible things at it such as that it's susceptible to noise, it rapidly loses coherence, it has a short lifetime, and so on and so forth. And indeed, it goes without saying that in order to scale up the technology, we will have to significantly increase both quality and quantity of our quantum bits. But the question I'd like to ask today is whether this is the end of the story. And the answer is, is no. I'll rephrase. For example, if you have today a 50 qubits or a 16 qubits or an 11 qubits processor, can you today run the most complex protocols that these quantum processors allow you to? The answer is no. In fact, the answer is not at all. And this stems from something very fundamental, which we like to illustrate in this way, and I'll explain. You may know that in order to merely describe the information contained in a quantum processor with 300 qubits, you would need more classical transistors than the number of atoms in the universe. And this stems from something very fundamental which is that the complexity of quantum systems scales exponentially with the number of units, which is not the case for the classical systems that we use in order to control and operate them. Making operating and controlling QPUs fundamentally challenging, and therefore have led us to the conclusion that it is so challenging that it requires the focus of an entire company and the focus of QM. Now, in order to understand this challenge and all the other challenges in the quantum computer stack better, I'd like to go a little bit deeper and understand how the quantum computer works. And before that, how the classical computer works. We'll do that real quick. So as you know by now, the classical computer is based on the bits. The bits is either 1 or 0. Right? If you have n bits, n is the favorite number for physicists, then they can be in different binary combinations. Right? And you know by now that the, tr the thing is, the limitation, is that you can be in only one of them at every single point of time. How does it reflect on running an algorithm? So running an algorithm on a classical processor, you can think of it conceptually as if you have a binary combination. It is a full description of your processor. And then in every clock cycle of your processor, you go to a different binary combination, a different one, and a different one. And the final binary combination is, in fact, your result. Okay? This is so trivial, you may be asking yourselves, why is he saying that? Right? And I'm saying that because quantum computers work differently. Right? The quantum computers are based on the qubits, 0 and 1 at the same time. If you have n qubits, they can be in all of these binary combinations. But then, extending on that, they can be in all of them at the same time. In fact, they can be in any combination of different combinations at every single point of time. How does it reflect on running the algorithm practically? Practically, you also begin with a certain binary combination. But then at every cycle of the algorithm, 
you can move to maybe more binary combinations, right? Because you remember you're a quantum. If I'm quantum, I don't have to be in one binary combination. Maybe I can be in four. And maybe from each one of these, I can go to two others, and so on and so forth. And this is the fundamental thing that we leverage in order to get computational power, this immense computational power with quantum computers, OK? Now, in order to nail this down completely, we'll have to talk about interference and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, it is the ability to go through multiple computational paths simultaneously that we leverage in order to get this immense computational power. But let's take a little bit, um, let's go a little bit deeper and see how it works in practice. This is getting more interesting. Now, the classical computers, you may know that, are based on logic gates. The logic gates, in fact, take these binary combinations, the bits, as an input, and give you other bits, another binary combination, as an output. A simple example would be the multiplier. Yeah, it takes a 2 and a 3 in binary, and it gives you 6 in binary. Yeah? And the thing to retain here is that the logic gates of the classical processor are within the classical processor. Once it goes out of the fab, the logics are inside. It could be the NAND, it could be a multiplier, it could be a neural network. It's within the processor by fabrication. So you can think of it in the following way. The, the way you run the, the algorithm is then you have the gates within the processor, and you input data, and you get data at the other end. Okay. Now, this is still uh, rather trivial for some of you, and you may be asking again, why is he saying all that? And I'm saying all that because here again, quantum computers work for fundamentally differently in the following way. In the quantum computer, you have the quantum processor. The quantum processor itself contains quantum data. In fact, it merely does not contain any logics inside. And you may ask, so where's the logics? The logics, in fact, are sent to the quantum processor typically via microwave pulses or laser pulses. And then the next question that you are surely asking, so who is sending these pulses? And the big surprise here is that the one who is sending these pulses is a classical processor. Going back to our analogy earlier, right? we are using classical systems in order to control quantum systems which are exponentially more complex and more rich, and therefore the focus of QM. Now, this allows us to understand this specific challenge, but also the other challenges in the quantum computer stack. Okay, so let's look at the stack. So the, thing, the first thing that we see, of course, is that the quantum computer stack has three main layers, right? You can break this down into thousands, but three main layers, okay? Quantum hardware, classical hardware, and software in contrast to the hardware-software paradigm of classical computation. In the quantum hardware, fundament the, primarily you have the quantum processors and quantum-compatible electronics and so on and so forth. In the classical hardware, primarily you have quantum processors, and classical processors, I'm sorry. In between, you have these gates in the form of pulses. Primarily in the software, you have quantum algorithms and applications extensively discussed in this, in, the, in this conference, written in quantum programming languages, many of these today already. In between, you have compilers. Now, the thing to retain here is that, in fact, there is a very interesting line here. Again, there is a line just above the quantum hardware. Anything below it is extremely complex, extremely rich. Anything above it is extremely poor, extremely simple. It's classical. Yeah? Therefore, inducing many challenges that we're seeing already today that have to be faced with supercomputing resources which are backing the classical stack, OK? For things which naively could have been thought to be very simple, such as results verification, algorithm optimization, pulse optimization, system calibration, and so on and so forth. Each and every, um, each and every uh, 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 layer here is extremely challenging. But nonetheless, thanks to great minds and great companies, such as the ones noted over here, quantum computing is today no longer science fiction. But in fact, nor is it still a reality. And for that, we have introduced the quantum orchestration platform, uh, which we will, um, in a couple of weeks, launch formally. Uh, but I can say already today that the quantum orchestration platform is up and running and deployed for some of the leading players in quantum, in quantum computing, including compute multinationals, quantum startups, government labs, 
and academic institutions, some of them you know very well, and working on multiple of the quantum platforms that have been um, discussed in this conference. So with this, I'd like to thank you very much and uh, hope that together we will be able to realize the potential of quantum computers.